Hello, everyone. My name is Bryn Boyce, Associate Artistic Director of Commonwealth Shakespeare Company. Thank you for joining us today for our latest installment of Tempest Talks, a new series that takes a look inside our upcoming production of The Tempest. Today, we're talking about all things access, in particular, our ASL interpretation and audio description services. I'll be chatting with Christopher Robinson, CSC's access advocate and ASL English interpreter, and with Corey Couture, our audio describer. But first things first, should you need it, Speech recognition captioning is being used for this talk. Just locate the CC option in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window, click it, and select the Show Subtitles option to see the captions. If you're viewing this on a rebroadcast, hello to you too, and you should be seeing our open captioning now at the bottom of the screen. For our patrons who use audio description, and for those of you listening along, again, I am Bryn. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I have blondish, almost shoulder length hair with dark roots, and I'm wearing round glasses and a black blouse. I'll have our guests self describe when they enter the webinar. Before we start, I would like to take a moment to recognize the indigenous land on which we reside as an expression of appreciation, awareness, and gratitude. I am currently in Medford, and both Corey Couture and Chris Robinson are in Melrose on colonized land in the traditional tribal territory of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples. We would also like to acknowledge that the digital technology that we're using together today is not available in many indigenous communities. To learn more about CSC's work toward racial equity, including this process of land acknowledgement, please visit comshakes.org. Today's Tempest Talk program is free, but we hope that you will consider a donation of $10 or any amount that's meaningful to you. To donate, visit comshakes.org slash donate. In these uncertain times, your support of the arts and access is more important than ever. CSC is best known, as you may know, for its annual Free Shakespeare on Boston Common. We're putting together an outstanding production of The Tempest to share with you this year, directed by Steve Mailer, featuring John Douglas Thompson as Prospero. Our esteemed guests tonight are a few of our incredible access team members. We're going to talk about what that even means, right? Let's introduce them now. Accessibility Advocate with CSC, Disability and Access Services Outreach and Training Coordinator at Boston University, ASL English Interpreter, Member of the Board of Directors for Stage Source, and Certified Facilitator in LEGO Serious Play Methodology, Chris Robinson. Come on in. Hello, hello. I did all that. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkable. Uh, yeah, Chris Robinson here. Uh, I'm African American male. I'm a little shiny. I'm proud of that tonight. Uh, licorice locks, short licorice locks of hair. And uh, to stay with the food metaphor, uh, a little bit of salt and pepper in the beard and, and wearing a, a green shirt um overshirt and uh with a white background i'm here in my house and uh in melrose as you said good evening all awesome and audio describer audio description narrator and audio description coordinator corey couture come on in corey hello, hello. hi there so uh yes i'm corey my pronouns are she her hers and i'm a white woman in my mid 50s with short dark brown hair and kind of a page boy um with dark uh with brown eyes and today i'm wearing a sleeveless black top and shimmery rectangular blue glass earrings um in the background is my living room with red curtains and leafy trees outside um i'd also like to um, note that although people can't usually tell at first glance i actually have a disability myself i have spina bifida um, had upwards of 25 surgeries as a kid, and then um, created a one woman show um, for my master's program about how the arts provided a positive context for working through life's challenges. And I mentioned this because I want audience members to know that folks with disabilities can have all kinds of jobs and perhaps see some elements of themselves in my experience. So there you Amen go. That. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> I, I have to start. Um, by noting that the two of you have worked with CSC before. Could you uh, talk about how long you have been with us and in what capacity? Um, Chris, Corey, who wants to go first? Fight it out. 
Corey, you want to go for it? Okay, okay, I'll start. So um, I've only been with CSC for a couple of years. In, in the past, I've, I've volunteered during Shakespeare on the Common performances that were being described by um, Jan Stankus and Liz Montigny and our much missed colleague, Alice Austin, who we lost a few years ago. Um, then in the summer of 2019, I was the primary audio describer for Cymbeline, working alongside secondary describer Aunt Andrea Doan. Um, and then in the brave new Zoom-based world of 2020, I provided both the pre-show and in-show description for the online reading of The Tempest last summer. And um, I'll be describing uh, the, the live version. I can't wait to see it all up on its feet. Awesome. How about you, Chris? You're a, you're a veteran. Ooh, man, <laughs> veteran. Um, so first of all, full disclosure, I'm a playbill hoarder. Okay. Uh, I collect too many of them, but it was the only way that I could uh, dig up the answer. Then I found out later on the CSC site that you can look at the program uh, production history, uh, help me remember the date. But in terms of my playbill hoarding, uh, this was my first CSC production. It is uh, a playbill that I'm holding of Henry V. Uh, Anthony Rapp played uh, Henry, and I did that show along with uh, ASL interpreter Damon Tim who at that time was a Northeastern University ASL interpreting alum of the university, he just graduated from the program, and his thesis uh, assignment was interpreting Henry V. So, you know, he was primed, he was ready cool. for it. And uh, we worked with a wonderful Dazzle, D-A-S-L, Dazzle, we'll dive into that a little bit later, uh, Director of Artistic Sign Language, Bill Carwile. Uh, who's a, a deaf actor and a mime who studied with Marcel Marceau. A little trivia. So we're talking 2002 when all that happened. 2002. That's amazing. That's so. That's so great. Uh, I, you're a true CSC folk. Um, <laughs> I mainly, but as you started to unpack, I want to talk today about the nature of your work. I know that each and every time I talk to Chris, I learn so much. My mind is blown, and I find that I am especially and continually jarred by what I don't know in the access arena, including jobs, whole career paths that I didn't know about. And Chris, you've said to me before. It's because this is invisible but highly collaborative work. Can you both speak to that and, and, and unpack the important things that we should know about access in the theater and, and just what, what it is that you all do? Sure. Corey, we can riff off of each other um, to kind of resemble some of the conversations we have behind the scenes about our invisible collaborative work. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to jump around a little bit because I'm, I'm enthusiastic about um, the craft, almost the pseudoscience of what we do. Um, as an interpreter, as with any Shakespearean text, you can take it, right? And you can go off in any general direction in terms of interpretation or production and presentation style. So if an interpreter like myself were to work in a vacuum, apart from the production team, apart from the dramaturg, you know, you'd have two entirely different shows going on. Obviously not the goal. Um, unfortunately, although we've moved past that in, in, in several years, unfortunately we started out as an add-on, bolted on to the production, a reaction to the production that was on the stage. Um, but uh, CSC, since the beginning, since, uh, you know, Twelfth Night and Midsummer Tempest, uh, there's always been an intention about inclusion and representation. Uh, so the invisible part is more often about the audience. The audience sees what they see on television sometimes where a sign language interpreter pops up in a bubble and they're doing it all in real time. And isn't that cool that we have the technology to do that? Or we go out and see a show and then those sign language interpreters are off to the side. Aren't they cute? Aren't they wonderful? But you don't see all the blood, sweat and tears and the rehearsal process going in. Not that we compare actors and interpreters and who does more work. It's, there's no Olympics like that. But what our work is, is different and cognitively taxing in a different way. Whereas your actors are really getting access to the layers of meaning, in this case, the English text or however many degrees of separation to contemporary use of the English text. We're going that English text, that degrees of separation, 
right? From how it was used in that contemporary time. And now what does that look like in a visual spatial language? All that work has to be done before the actors even get in the groove of a piece. That stuff you don't see. Um, but otherwise on television, sometimes you get the, uh, the trope version of, oh yeah, I know what actors do behind the scene in the rehearsal hall, but the access team is doing a lot of that stuff. So it takes collaboration with the directors, dramaturg, one-on-one -on -one with the actors, and then the actor will evolve by the time you've done the show. So we need to engage with them even more to make sure that we're keeping integrity to the piece. Corey, I know you're digging in too uh, when it comes to that. One second. Yeah. Before, may, may I ask one question of Chris before of we move to audio description? Because there's one thing that you told me a, a while ago that has really stuck with me about what you mean in terms of um, the layers of meaning. So we're, when we're looking at a Shakespeare text, um, we sort of take for granted that that you the example you gave me was when you were doing Othello, the word the more. And I, I was wondering if you could if you could just tell that little story, and then I want to move because there's the same there's very similar things that Corey I want to ask you about. In your sure, work. sure, sure. Um, so what I'll do is I'll demonstrate and I'll also describe uh, what I'm doing here. Um, so the more in in the piece Othello, if you're familiar with it, you're you're not familiar with it. Um, this notion of darkness or blackness um, can be used in a pejorative way or in an elevated way, a heightened way, honorific way, depending upon the inflection of the voice of the actor who's producing the terms, the more. Of course, it's the same words in text. So how do you convey that differently in American Sign Language? Well, working with an ASL coach, we developed a whole a bunch of different ways to convey that this notion of as I brush the index finger, index finger, all my four fingers across the side of my right cheek, there is a tenderness to it as if I'm wiping a tear from my eyes. And with two swipes, that's the sign that was used to convey the more anytime that was referenced in the play. However, if it was used in a pejorative way, a derogatory way with a mean is the more, let's say that was it. Then we flipped the hand over as if I'm flicking a fly or a piece of mud off of the side of my cheek. So it, it's something that I do not desire, do not want there. And just depending upon the speed and, and, and the placement of my hand, I'm conveying the more in that same space, uh, but in a sinister way or an honorific way. So cool. So in, in that in that vein, we talked a little bit, Corey, about about your work as an audio description um, specialist. Let's let, please talk about your job, and then I'm going to ask you about a specific thing you said to me. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, well, so I I tend to like to give people a very basic overview of what audio description is because so many people just have no idea that it's a thing that it exists. Um, so, and also thinking about the whole point of it being kind of um, very much an invisible part of a production. Um, the basically audio description is the art of um, describing everything that's happening visually on stage for folks who are blind or visually impaired. Um, although it can be useful for lots of other people as well. And I'll talk about maybe some more details about, you know, how it's put together and all that. But from the perspective of invisibility of access services, um, I do the lion's share of my job alone at home, working from a video of, of a performance of the show um, to write my script because um, the description that I'm providing is not off the cuff. It's very carefully crafted to fit in the pauses, the natural pauses in the dialogue or music or um, soundscape of the show. Um, and having that video in front of me means that I can practice the timing to make sure everything that I write fits within those pauses. Um, occasionally I will uh, talk over a little bit of dialogue, but only if it's something that's absolutely vital, the audience won't be able to follow what's happening, or um, if it's something that's been repeated multiple times, information that they already have, then I might talk over it to get flesh out what's happening. It's particularly hard in Shakespeare because there's just 
there are so many words and there is so little time to say anything. <laughs> so it's all about being concise. Um, and the other thing about, uh, about it is that the audience who is listening to the audio description gets a receiver and headsets from the theater. And then um, we describers sit at the back of the theater or on the common, we sit under a tent, under a canopy near the Parkman bandstand toward the back of the audience. Um, and in a, a regular um, show inside a theater, basically we walk in, go straight up to the sound booth and often don't even interact with anybody from the theater at all. Uh, so much of this work is just a solitary process of describing what's happening and trying to get all of that timing right. So the audience, the rest of the audience who's not wearing these headsets has no idea that this is happening. Um, and yeah, I, I, that, from the invisibility perspective, uh, I think that's important to, to mention. One thing that's interesting is that, or maybe this is what you were gonna ask about, um, is that during the pandemic, I actually did get a chance to describe several productions online. So there was The Tempest for CSC. Yes. I did a couple of shows for New Rep uh, back in December. And then I just recently described a live online magic show for the ART, which That's was awesome. crazy. <laughs> and just stop to think for a minute about what it means to describe magic as it's happening. And that's a whole other story. It was really fun. It worked really well, but. That's um, amazing. So to make yeah. invisible visible, I want to show um, the folks at, at home some, uh, some different slides that we sort of put together um, be, just to show you the kinds of setups that, that people have. And please feel free as I click through these um, to describe what you're seeing and also um, any, any jobs, any little, those sort of different jobs within the access arena that we might have missed. So let me share my screen real quick here. All right. Maybe. <laughs> it's always so. It's always so good. There we go. Okay. So, so yeah. So this is Chris. We see, we see Chris doing. Is this from Othello? Yes, it is from uh, Othello, uh, along with my colleagues Aaron Maljuri and uh, Dr. Deanna um, Ammon Gagney. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, doing Othello. So that the, the three of us there, and uh, we. I think our ASL coach was uh, Sabrina Dennison. Yeah. That's all. So here's a here's a photo, a, a very a lively Chris, um, <laughs> but you can also see where they are um, in relation to the stage there. It's fun with the actor what, right here. I'd like to point out one thing um, that you you may notice that the lighting for this show there's some downlight uh, coming up. So there the light isn't necessarily coming I think from in front of us, but coming from uh, above. And I think that uh, in another slide, we'll see an image of another um, uh, lighting and designer. There, here yeah. we are, Annie. Yeah, uh, this is Annie Wiegand, uh, who's a, the lighting designer, uh, the uh, uh, C uh, CFA College of Fine Arts alum of Boston University. Uh, and Annie is also deaf. Uh, Annie's probably one of the first deaf lighting designers as a career uh, in the country. Uh, she uh, lives here on the East Coast, and Annie was brought in to make sure that CSC was going to have a consistent model or template for lighting interpreters to ensure accessibility. So that's Annie Wiegand. Um, can I also mention something about that image that where we were looking at the three of you interpreters, you were somewhere in front of the stage, a little ways in front of the stage, and we could see in the background an actor on stage um performing so you're not actually on the stage with them i'm just tr sort of trying to describe for folks who can't see the screen here um and is that what normally happens how far away are you from the stage normally when you're doing this yes typically that is the station um for uh for safety for visibility and proximity to the audience who is laying out in the grass and the lawn um it's, it's interesting that what is the equivalent to volume and sight line mm. uh, for ASL interpreters is the closer to the audience, the increased volume, so to speak, or the increased clarity, the further you are away, 
it would be the equivalent of uh, having diminished volume. Although yes. ideally, and I think we'll get to this in some of our conversation, the aspiration is to have uh, all languages on the same stage uh, in the same space. So let's, I want to look too at um, this, um, Corey, you were talking earlier about this particular um, photo, which is a sort image, of a photo yeah. montage image yeah. Yeah. Um, of captioning on the left yeah. from Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so there are three images here side by side. The first one is a shot of Romeo and Juliet um, being performed on the stage. And there is a, a, a pop-up LED screen with three lines of text in red that is following along with what the actors are saying on stage. And uh, then the central image is of two folks with white canes and sunglasses um, visiting the access uh, table on the common when they got come to the show and they are being uh, given the headsets and receivers that they will use to hear the audio description. And then the third image is of Jan Stankus and Liz Montigny in the audio description tent toward the back of the theater. Like I said, each of them with a script in their hands. And uh, they have two separate jobs. Jan um, normally does the secondary description and Liz does the primary. Um, Can you unpack the, what those two things are? Because that, that's something sure. that I, I learned from you very recently that there, yeah. there's a, a difference there. And I'm gonna show some more um, uh, images of, of the little um, setups that you have as you talk. You bet, you bet. So, um, so generally speaking, for a live theatrical performance, there are two different audio descript description scripts. One is called the secondary, ironically, because it's usually the one that is read first. It's usually read during the first uh, 15 or 20 minutes leading up to curtain, so before the show starts. And the purpose of that, and sorry, before I go on to what exactly that is for, this primary description is the description that is being delivered live during the performance itself and fit into those pauses I mentioned earlier. The purpose of the pre-show description is to flesh out all kinds of visual details that we don't have time to talk about during the performance itself. So we go into great detail about the set, the costumes, the props, um, special terminology with uh, definitions of terms for things like particular kinds of dance or stylistic conventions that are going to be used in the production maybe uh, lighting cues that when lighting changes in a certain way, it means X, Y, Z, and we sort of give people a sense of that in advance. Uh, and also we talk in the pre-show about what the actors look like. And one of the things that we, at least here in the Boston area, I don't know if this is done other places, but in general, we usually ask the actors in the show to give us a self description. So rather than me say, talking about an actor who is Asian American or uh, Mexican or guessing just from what mm -hmm. I see in front of me, we ask those people to identify themselves both visually, they can talk about their skin tone and their hair and uh, their size and shape in whatever way they want to. Again, rather than me making my interpretation that might not be accurate. It's also an opportunity for people to identify uh, groups they're a part of, kind of like me saying, you know, I'm, I'm part of the disability community myself. Other people might say, you know, I'm uh, part of the LGBTQ plus community or, or whatever, something that they add in to let audience members know that there are people like them involved in these productions. It provides so much texture. It's just one of the things that I didn't I, I didn't realize was part of audio description is is the like added wonderful texture that helps to flesh out the, the full story. So it's not just hearing, you know, words that it is that it is giving a, like a, a giving a picture that you feel in your body. I think that's really really cool. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. sorry. I'm just um, going to stop sharing for just a moment. Um, the uh, other things that I want to talk about to, with you before we before we know is our um, dazzle. You said you were going to describe um, what dazzle was, Chris. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, the director of artistic sign language. Uh, I won't say this is a new position, but it's newly recognized. And what I mean by that is um, there's an example of a deaf actor, John McGinty, who in fact is um, the Eastern uh, Eastern Council representative for Actors Equity. Again, a deaf actor. Uh, and I think there's an image of him. Yeah, let me bring that up. Um, John McGinty is one of a cohort of deaf artists who have really honed in the specialization of consulting theater companies. Yeah, John McGinty is a gentleman on the right. You don't have a full frontal picture of him. I don't uh, think I do. He's wearing glasses on the right. No, Ian no, Sanborn sorry. is on the left also wearing a, a black shirt. But I'll, I'll tell you a bit about them as Dazzles or Directors of Artistic Sign Language. Um, directors of Artistic Sign Language make sure that the translation uh, into American Sign Language that the director and the playwright intends to make sure that integrity is kept. So there's a bit of dramaturgical work. What would a sign or representation of a thought or a notion or a concept or an, uh, an artifact of a period, what would that look like in a visual spatial language? How can we keep the nuance of, you know, does a phone look like uh, I'm holding a piece like an ice cream cone in front of my mouth and holding another earpiece directly over to my ear. Is that the kind of phone we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Or are we talking about a mobile device as I use my hand? But it's the same word phone. The director of artistic sign language makes sure that each interpreter keeps integrity and con is consistent with uh, those intentions. Um, and uh, consistently, the director of artistic sign language will always be a deaf artist so that they have qualifications as an artist for theater um, and that they have the intuition and the, and going back to representation as Corey was talking about, the experience perspective on both sides of the curtain, the production lens, as well as the consumption lens of the, what the audience is going to experience. And uh, I, I wouldn't do my work. I don't do my work in isolation and just getting up on the side of the stage and just sign what I hear. I will always work with a director of artistic sign language um, in as much as no actor is just gonna get right out on stage without having the input of a director or, or an audience. Very cool. There, okay, so one or two more jobs that I'm, su that I'm super excited about too are our <laughs> captioners. Um, so we have the, the um, open captioning show um, every year at, at um, CSC. Can you talk about that uh, work and the, the difference between open and closed? Sure, sure. Um, I wish uh, one of our colleagues, uh, David Chu of C2 Captioning, I wish he could be here tonight. In fact, there were a couple of other directors of artistic sign language I wanted to be here tonight. But unfortunately for them, but unfortunate for us, they're doing the work. In fact, there was a, a <laughs> webinar just last night where about six of them were advising theaters in New York uh, about uh, the, the notion of directors of artistic sign language. Sometimes they need a night off. So um, David Chu, uh, who's doing the work right now, has been a longtime uh, caption provider for CSC shows. And the thing that blew my mind uh, about David's work is he says, hey, Chris, um, captioning is much like technical theater. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you have your stage manager calling the show and you may have hundreds, depending on the show, if we're talking like Hamilton, thousands of cues, right? Say, so, yeah, so, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Almost word for word or phrase for phrase. Now, when you're talking about Hamilton or Shakespeare and they rival each other in terms of words, right? Yeah. He says, I'm knocking out thousands of cues. So if we want uh, an analogy of what captioning is like in terms of the work and really preparing for it, think of it in terms of technical theater, in terms of programming all of those cues. Now, the difference between open captioning and closed captioning is uh, similar to what you've experienced this evening in order to see text come across your screen or to see text come on your television, if an event is captioned, you have to engage the feature. 
like on your DVD player or who uses DVDs anymore. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> and that's the <laughs> closed <laughs> captioning that you only see when you select it, right? Exactly. That's the option. But opening ca open captioning is the ideal for theater, uh, for film, um, and uh, for, for spaces like uh, CSC in which anyone can sit anywhere in the audience in proximity to the LED screen that provides the captioning, right? And no one has to disclose, am I utilizing the captioning because I'm deaf or am I utilizing the captioning because that Shakespearean text goes so doggone fast. So fast, yeah, yeah. Right, well, yeah. It's, it brings up a really interesting point that we were talking about the other day too, is that not only open captioning, but uh, audio description is really helpful for other populations, mm -hmm. not only those who have uh, uh, low vision or are blind or, can you talk about uh, that, uh, that, Corey? I know you were talking, sure. um, I, open captioning, I, I use all the time. Me too. I like I, to read and hear the words at the same drives time. Drives other people crazy. I keep it on all the time at home. And one other thing that I wanted to say before I talk about, about the description part of things uh, is that the people who are preparing captioning for a, a production begin with the script itself. And they go through and have a very particular way that they have to format that script so that it's in small chunks you know, three lines at a time on that LED screen. And go on the feed. Correct. And depending on, on the production and the actors, I believe, I have not done this myself, but I believe the way it works is that they will go to some rehearsals. The captioners will go to a number of rehearsals and have a set of alternative forms of a sentence that actors might say if they don't get the lines exactly as they are in the script. And that happens not infrequently, less so in Shakespeare, but mm -hmm. that is, that is <laughs> a big, yeah, actors, <laughs> remember what was written, you know, learn your lines. So, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so the, uh, the caption, the person who's delivering the captions, that's, you know, running the computer and hitting enter to go from line to line has to keep up with what's happening on stage. And sometimes on the fly, pick a different version of the sentence than the one that pops up automatically. So wow. yeah, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky job. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry, run your question about description. No, we, oh, yeah, we were just talking again. about, you know, um, that, that uh, audio description is also helpful for other populations. Oh, yes, 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 yeah. right, right. Well, uh, so for example, you, you definitely do not need to be blind or visually impaired to appreciate audio description. It's great for people on the autism spectrum because it helps them to understand interpersonal interactions, emotional cues, facial expressions, how you interact with people appropriately. It helps to you know, give some um, education for that population. People with ADHD who have, or other attention challenges, this helps them to figure out where to direct their focus at any given moment of what's going on on stage. If there are six or seven things happening, the describer will ideally find the most important thing or things that are happening. So the person doesn't have to do quite so much work to decipher and doesn't get quite so distracted by things. Yeah. Chris, yeah, raising yeah, your hand. Yeah, me too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, Chris, yeah. I, I, I appreciate um, that comment about um, knowing where to focus and when to focus because i've been um a, a student a casual student of audio description services as well so i put on the headset uh during the ad night and why that's great for me as an interpreter is because if we're stationed the way we, you were you saw in the in the previous image all of the action is to our back and we're not right. seeing it so we eavesdrop off of the script of the audio describers to get those specific routine pattern, uh, climactic moments that really need to be seen so that we can bring attention away from ourselves as the interpreter for that, that, that moment of physicality uh, yeah. or facial expression that moves the story forward. I, so, I hadn't um, even thought about that. I hadn't even thought about that and that there is yet another invisible 
support system that is existing with access and inclusion. It's really um, amazing. I want to talk. It's crazy, I to, right? I, I have to ask both of you, how did you get started in this field? Before before we end our night, I've got to I, I've got to hear these these stories because I, I it's so such a vibrant, um, wonderful thing that you're doing. And I, I, I want to know what, what brought you to this? Yeah. Um, can, can I just, I just wanted to give a very quick to finish up that list of other people that are can be can oh, yes, benefit yes. from audio description. So you have people on the autism spectrum, folks with ADHD, children or other people who are acquiring language for the first time. It can help them, you know, to to get used to the, the right. language. People who are auditory learners more than visual learners can really benefit. And just in general, I think it's helpful for anyone who needs help keeping track of characters and locations and this one's in a disguise and that one's the <laughs> same person but i didn't know that it you know like um, in in the tempest ariel for a scene or two invisible yeah. right yep. it's yes, gonna be really exactly important. exactly <laughs> yeah. anyhow so i just want to say <laughs> thank you all kinds of people can benefit from description and i i i strongly urge possibly beg people to try listening to it sometime and you may find that you're learning all kinds of things that you weren't paying attention to whether it's at a live performance or uh audio description is also available in movie theaters most big movies that come out have audio description you just have to ask for the equipment at the theater the cinema uh and also there's tons of audio description on tv netflix amazon prime apple are just packed with it so so turn it on sometime and just have a listen. That's fantastic. Thank just you. To say it. Yeah. Pro, sure. pro tip for real. Yeah. yeah pro exactly. tip. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Chris, can you, I, would you mind say, I, I would love to just know how, how you came to this. Sure thing. Uh, again, forgive me. I'm an only child. So sometimes it's long winded, but a uh, long time ago, um, <laughs> my my proximity to deaf people um, was in third grade my teacher thought that it would be a good idea to put me right in the middle of my friends uh who were in third grade and separate them because they were using sign language to communicate with each other both of them <laughs> came from two separate deaf families oh, and look how that turned out miss kate <laughs> yeah i literally became a sign language interpreter but uh, fast forward uh, my real appreciation for the language came from my spiritual community. They were members of the deaf community in my church in Louisiana, uh, as well as uh, up here in the north. But I was on track to maintain what my grandfather had done and what my uncles were doing, which was being a licensed butcher. With the gun <laughs> food master right in Somerville, cutting meat, you know, and forgive the, the vegans and the vegetarians, but that's what I was doing, thought that was going to be my career. But Amazing. the proximity of that supermarket was right down the road from a, an area that was populated by a large deaf community and sign language interpreter community who are my customers. And oh. long story shorter, those individuals really put me under their wing to bring me to the training programs, uh, Northeastern University workshops, commission for the deaf and hard of hearing state agency trainings, uh, being taken under the wing at the uh, College Park, Maryland, um, and, and getting my interpreter training there. And yet, um, there wasn't a track for interpreting for the theater, which mm. is a different animal than just conventional interpreting. There were individuals uh, who I wish, you know, some of them could be here tonight. Monique Holt, Alexandria Wales, Janice Cole, Patrick McCarthy, uh, Sabrina Dennison, uh, who really, who come from uh, degreed artist, you know, background, really took me under their wing and were patient with me and helped me craft uh, how I am today. And, uh, <laughs> when I think I knew, you know, you figure out things in hindsight, um, was when I was a bit arrogant one day out at this disability Woodstock kind of event uh, <laughs> that was out on Copley Square uh, Plaza. We got uh, the Boston Center for Independent Living Disability Services Organization. It was a big disability awareness kind of event. And I think I knew the music a little better than the interpreter that was up there. And then one deaf person said, okay, with your chutzpah, get up there. And let's see what you got. 
And then I worked for that deaf person, the executive director of the agency for the next five years wow. before going on to the Boston Arts Academy and now at B. That's so amazing. That's so great. I love that. I love the Miss Tate. Thanks, Miss Tate. That's for, you know, I love that. It's so fun. How about you, Corey? You, I, how did you get how did you get into this field? Well, um, I have and my undergrad graduate degree is in theater from Northwestern University. Okay. Nice. And growing up with spina bifida, I sort of was generally drawn and had an interest in access and inclusion of people with disabilities just uh, was important to me, not just for myself, but to see other people around me being included in things. And then a few years after I graduated from college, I ended up temping at WGBH in Boston, where yeah, yay, yay, GBH. <laughs> uh, and a couple of years into that, a new service was being developed at GBH called Descriptive Video Service, which was going to be providing audio description for PBS programming at the time to begin with. That was what was being done. And I thought this sounds amazing. I'm really interested in this. So I took the test. I ended up joining the team during the its second year which was it started in 1990 so they just had their 30th anniversary last year which is mind-blowing nice. and makes me feel very old uh, <laughs> but so i just happened to be in the right place at the right time to jump in and kind of uh, apply my writing skills i think i was a, a decent writer and also a very keen observer about the world around me i I'm very focused on visual details a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I took the test and ended up doing description there for about four years, uh, first for PBS shows, then for other TV uh, films, movies on home video. We started doing a bunch of things for Disney and, and various other companies and got some really good experience in, in describing and became a much better writer as in the process because you don't have much choice. You have to get, you have to be more concise more precise and yeah it really helped me to to improve my writing then i went off and did a whole bunch of different jobs for about 15 years a very long stretch and i went to see a friend in a play in chicago about eight years ago and it was audio described and i said oh yeah I know that theater has live audio description. I was looking for something new to do with my life at that time. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, I have this theater degree and I definitely know how to do audio description. So I, I went to a, a friend who I knew did theater audio description in Boston and she sent me to Wheelock Family Theater where I had a conversation with the lovely Charles Baldwin who now works for uh, the state um, Mass Cultural Council. And it just so happened this friend that sent me to him was moving out of town at that moment. And so they had an opening. They needed a new describer. I was like, I'll give it a try. Why not? I think I have these skills. And I have described almost every show that Wheelock has done since then, with a few exceptions. And beyond that, I started working with more and more theaters in the Boston area and and working on helping theaters understand what audio description is and helping them to begin offering it, which is where that sort of coordinator stuff comes in. Anyhow, so that's basically what what happened there. That's great. Well, OK, so on that note, um, just to sort of wrap up and then I'm going to and I'm going to tell you the dates that access is happening. But what are your give me your hopes? Chris, your, your hopes for access in the theater and Corey, your hopes for access in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, two hopes. One, to somewhat render myself obsolete. Um, <laughs> the more representation um, that is actually on the stage, then the, uh, the least amount of time you'll need a conduit like myself. Uh, my uh, hope would look like um, more sign language interpreters or more access accommodations in the production process, behind the curtain, in the rehearsal hall, in the rehearsal room, because folks with disabilities, folks who are deaf and hard of hearing, folks who are blind, low vision, are actually in the rehearsal hall as directors or actors or designers or technicians or what have you, so that everybody can come out and see a show. 
Um, that would be my one hope. And um, I think my second hope um, is to hear what Corey's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Way to pass the buck the there. Okay. Um, so one one hope I have is is the same thing that Chris is talking about. I started saying that I did uh, described a bunch of shows in the past year, four or five shows online, which was a brand new experience. The thing that was really different for me about it as an essential part of the job is that I did have much more contact with the actors, the director, the designers, the tech folks in order to make it work, to, to figure out how to deliver the description to our populations, how to get the word out to those folks so that they knew the thing was being available, being made available with description. And so, th so that was really different for me. And I feel like, at least in the Boston area, I think we're a little bit more nascent. We're, we're just getting started with trying to integrate more folks who are blind and vis visually impaired. Um, I do know, at least a couple of people who are who are blind that work as audio description narrators. So uh, I haven't seen it for live theater, but I know this is done for some TV and film. There there are organizations out there that only use blind audio or visually impaired audio describers. So there's a lot of opportunity there. And other hopes I have. So I. Basically, I want everybody to know that audio description exists to the point yeah. that, like captioning, it's expected. You know, you go into a restaurant and you know that the captions can be turned on so you can figure out what's happening above the din of all the people, right? And it's just ubiquitous. Everybody sees captioning all the time. So I want people to know that description exists and to give it a try themselves so that they're able to help us evangelize on this topic. Yes. And uh, I, the other thing is that everybody knows somebody that can benefit from audio description. Everybody's got elderly relatives who are, who are and same thing with, with ASL interpreting and or captioning. Captioning can be helpful for older people who are just losing their hearing, but don't know sign language. So they can watch the screen and keep up with what's happening. So same thing with audio description. I love for people to know that it's there, A, for themselves, and B, to share it with other people who might need it and who might not think to go to the theater because they assume it's not going to be accessible for them. Um, and I think I mentioned, yeah, it's really all about exposure. Yeah. Yes. Chris. Corey helped me conjure another hope. Yeah. Uh, education, all the things that Corey just shared to me speak to education and institutional education. So yeah. we have a CFA program that's talking about these different tracks and their skill sets associated with those tracks in terms of writing, right? Mm -hmm. Writing, boom, audio description. Writing, boom, right into captioning, you know? Um, ASL uh, literacy in terms of deaf education programs. Uh, that can segue right into working with other deaf actors. And you put that on your CV, put that on your resume, um, that you have these other language fluencies, pursue those, and just expands uh, opportunities toward that goal of, of rendering ourselves obsolete. That's and awesome. when you when you talk about CFA programs, you mean the College of Fine Arts at BU, at BU. Wh where you also work? BU yes. and, and everyone, you know, I am biased about BU. <laughs> Me too. Uh, but it, it's everywhere, you know, there's, there's, yeah. there's plenty of work out there, plenty of opportunity, it. It should be everywhere. Well, yeah. thank you both for it. this. This has been an education again, like I said, every time I talk to you all, I, I learned so much. Um, and I, I just want to say before we go that since the last time we had a Tempest talk, big changes and announcements have been made. We are going to be in person this summer. Commonwealth Shakespeare Company has been watching very closely this new guidance around COVID-19 protocols as they evolve. But we will perform the Tempest July 21st to August 8th on Boston Common in front of a live audience. Our open captioning, just that you can write this down anyone or, or watch the recording tomorrow and, and it will be on the website soon. Our open captioning performance will be Friday, July 31st at 8 p.m. An ASL interpreted performance and audio described performance will be Saturday, August 1st at 6 p.m., an earlier show for you. 
And a second ASL interpreted performance will be Friday, August 6th at 8 p.m. There's also a rain date for all access performances on closing night, August 8th. All of this information and more will be found on our website in, within days, uh, www.comshakes.org. Corey Couture, Christopher Robinson, it was wonderful having you on Tempest Talks tonight for our Access for All edition. As we wrap up, folks, please don't forget to follow us on all social media platforms to stay informed about our other upcoming events. Our handle is at Comshakes. We'll also be posting this recording of Tempest Talks to social media tomorrow afternoon for others who might have missed out. Many thanks to all who have joined us. Thank you so much, Chris and Corey. Bye all. Thank you. Bye.